If you do not want to participate in a recorded program, feel free to leave the webinar at any time. Um, I will also let you know that the program will be posted to Flying Arts' uh, YouTube following the presentation. Uh, your name as an attendee will not be featured in the published recording, but if you do ask any questions, we might refer to you by name. Uh, so just be aware that that might um, occur towards the end of the presentation. Uh, Flying Arts would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and seas on which we work, live and create. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the unending connection of First Nations people to this country and support the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to voice treaty and truth. We value the contributions of First Nations artists, creatives, artisans, practitioners and communities to the work that we do. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping surrounding questions. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation today uh, in the chat box. It's just in the bottom right hand corner. Um, for the flow of the presentation, we will leave answering questions towards the end. Um, but as you think of them and as uh, they pop up, feel free to just pop them in the chat box and we'll circle back towards the end of the presentation. Um, Thank you very much for joining. It's so great to have uh, you all here for this wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to Hamish and hand over. Uh, Hamish is going to lead the presentation today uh, on how to articulate uh, creative concepts and really refine your writing as an artist or an arts worker. So I'll hand over. Thank you, Hamish. Thanks, Maddie. Um... I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I'm um, meeting today, the Turbul and Yagara people, and um, would like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that welcome to all First Nations people who are joining us today. So articulating your concept, uh, I'm a curator and a writer, an arts writer. Uh, what I want to preface this with is um, please don't be scared or intimidated about writing. It's it's so important um, in terms of articulating your practice. Everyone has to start somewhere. When I was a, a, a baby arts worker, I was terrified of writing and putting my thoughts together and publishing them. Um, but the sooner you start, the better it is and the better you get. And that's why I wanted to preface it, uh, the presentation, just with this screen grab of an Instagram post by Jerry Saltz. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jerry Saltz is an award-winning art critic for New York Magazine, uh, but had a really interesting journey to that point. He dropped out of art school and drove um, trucks, art transport trucks, uh, and didn't start writing till he's 40 or in his 40s. Um, he uh, is very active on social media. He um, is not trained as such, but has a brilliant encyclopedic mind and writes in a very clear uh, and thoughtful and thought provoking way about art. So um, he often peppers his Instagram account with these uh, kind of motivationals. <laughs> um, uh, but his advice is really sage here. So keep it simple, write how you talk, maybe share how you knew you were an artist, never oppose the words nature and culture, or say your work can't be put into words or that it's problemizing or troubling of anything, do it today. Um, so if you don't follow Jerry, I would recommend it. I'd also recommend clicking on some of his links and, and just having a go at some of his long form essays. Um, and the other thing I would say is his, his wife is the chief New York Times art critic, Roberta Smith, who writes in a very different but equally engaging way. Um, and so it's really interesting. Uh, they're, a, they're a power duo. Um, but Jerry came to writing later in, in life, I, I guess. And so for, for me anyway, he's, he's a, um, a bit of a touchstone and a reminder that you can start at any point. Um, so 
I wanted to begin by just, I guess, stating the obvious, but why do you need to write about your work? Um, so writing about your work is a reflective practice and it, it makes you think about the relationship between uh, you and the audience and your work and the audience. Um, it can also be a really useful exercise in terms of um, evaluating your own work and developing a critically in, engaged and responsive practice. And what I mean by critically engaged is um, you, you're thinking about how your work sits alongside the work of others. Um, how does it sit in different contexts? How does it sit in relation to other practices? Uh, and I think that's it's really important um, that you remember, although art making is often a solitary um, process, uh, that once it goes out into the world, it, it gains all these new meanings and relationships, and they can actually help your work become better um, just by an awareness and an engagement with some of those some of those those ideas of what does it mean to put my work next to another work? Uh, from a logistical or practicality, um, practical, practical level, uh, you know, I, I know many of you will hopefully be applying for the Regional Art Awards. And, uh, you know, as, as every art prize expects now, um, you have to write a statement introducing your work and who you are and your practice. And that's the same when you're applying for an exhibition, uh, but also residencies and, and grant funding. Uh, and, and, you know, for better or for worse, artists are expected to articulate their practice and to a range of audiences. Um, so one of the things that Maddie has asked me to, to talk about in this webinar is defining your artistic concepts. Now that's a huge piece of terrain. One of the things I'm, I'm trying to keep today quite top level, but hopefully give you some useful strategies that you can apply to your own practice. Um, and the most important, I think, is what is it that you're trying to say about your work or your practice as a whole? Um, what is it that you believe is the most important thing that someone engaging with your work needs to know um, in order to facilitate that engagement? Um, using clear and concise language and sentence structure is so important. Um, you know, get to the point, particularly if you're applying for an art prize, the reality is the judges or the selection panel have hundreds of applications and you've got to get them quick. You've got to get their attention quickly. So um, you don't have to use big words, especially if you don't understand them. It's much better to, to keep it really clear. And so I, when I was preparing this um, webinar, I just came up with a couple of um, generic or sort of on the moment responses that, that hopefully give you an idea of how you could start an artist statement. Um, so my practice is focused on painting and explores the relationship between art and technology. And then you would go on from there and go into uh, more detail. Um, or, or similarly, this work responds to the climate emergency and its impact on native wildlife. So they're just two abstract examples I made up, but they're really, um, really clear, direct, to the point, um, and, and straight away, the reader um, gets a sense of what your work is about and, and what your practice is. Um, so the other thing that Maddie asked me to mention is identifying your creative influences. Um, so this is a bit of a funny one, but I think it's an important point that, that artists, um, uh, particularly if you haven't sort of written a lot about your work previously, is, is the importance of acknowledging influences on your work. And that could be another artist. It could be a writer, a musician, a piece of poetry. Um, but if, if, if it's so important to the work that you've been inspired or informed by this particular artist or artwork, um, you should acknowledge it. But it's equally important to acknowledge or identify how is your work different? How does it build on that influence? What do you 
do with that influence? What do you take from it? And then what do you do to make it your own? Um, and if you don't acknowledge uh, <coughs> a, a source or as with writing an, uh, an academic essay, you know, it, it's seen as copying. Um, so I've, I've given one example just as a, a way that you could take, um, you could approach writing something about a work um, that you've made that you have potentially been inspired by. And in this case, I've used a, a, a famous visual art example. So this exhibition was influenced by Sidney Nolan's Ned Kelly series. However, my chosen medium is photography and I have set the images in Outback Queensland. And then in doing so, so this is the bit about how your work differs. Uh, I have made them relevant to a contemporary local audience. So it doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, the worst thing you can do is probably complicate it with too many words, um, uh, particularly in the context of applying for an opportunity. You want to be as clear and direct to the point as possible. So whoever is assessing the application gets a very quick, immediate sense of who you are and what your work's about. So um, there were three types of writing that, that um, I was asked to talk about today and hopefully give you some, some uh, advice or, or suggested start, starting points. But essentially, an artist statement should do the following things. Um, it should introduce you and your practice um, or your work. Um, it should in introduce the materials and processes used to make the work. Um, and, and really importantly, too, the ideas and themes that the work explores. So, um, you know, going back to the, the first uh, the first slide and example um, talking about artistic concepts. Um, it's not just about describing what the work is or what it looks like or what it's made out of. It, it should also um, speak to the ideas and themes that you're interested in exploring in a particular work. It may not have been inspired by a particular artist. Um, it might be about climate change or it might be about art and technology, but it's really important to articulate those ideas. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the previous slide, obviously to acknowledge those influences where, where relevant. So with these um, three different types of writing today, I've given, I'm giving um, actual examples, examples of artist statements, um, labels and um, biographies that I've actually written, um, hopefully to give a really practical illustration of how um, you might put something together. I chose this one um, because I actually think it's quite useful. I wrote it on a um, an artist's uh, practice for a prize that the artist um, was was uh, entering. And, and so the prize actually asked um, for the information to be provided under headings. And I actually think these are really useful headings that you could take and apply to your own work when crafting a statement. So um, in terms of how you would structure that statement, these are quite good. So the first one is describe yourself as an artist. Um, and so I might read each one out um, so you can sort of hear how it, uh, how it uh, comes together when it's spoken. I think that's a really useful idea. It's something I've done since I was a student, um, which is to read things back aloud. Read it to a friend or your partner, uh, a child, um, because sometimes you'll pick things up as you say it that you don't just by reading through the text. So encompassing drawing, painting, video and sculpture, Sam Cranston's practice examines power structures and the authority of images in shaping historical narratives. The artists research driven projects often consider hidden or tangential aspects of 20th century historical events, places and figures. His 2019 series Between Dystopia and Utopia, for example, examined the legacy of Greek town planner C.A. Doxiadis, who briefly migrated to Brisbane during the 1950s before returning to Europe to resume his career. 
The source material for much of Cranston's work comes from the artist's digital archive comprising tens of thousands of images saved from Google searches. So this artist statement was a maximum of 300 words. And what I did was break each, there were three headings. Uh, and so I broke it down to 100 words max for each one. So this is obviously about an artist who has progressed some way into their career. But I've also really tried to um, uh, speak about the most relevant uh, pieces of information, um, the, the types of media the artist uses, the ideas and issues that they're interested in um, exploring. And then I've given uh, a couple of specific examples to, to give context and flesh out um, those introductory sentences. Um, so this was for an art prize. So they asked uh, to describe the pro processes and materials. Uh, Lookout comprises a series of 12 sculptures, each one representing an archetypal observation structure. They are based on, the, on Cranston's own watercolours of images sourced from the internet and constructed from everyday materials, including timber and aluminium, either found or purchased from hardware stores. The artist taught himself to cut, prepare, and fix the materials together through the process of making. Cranston has simplified his structures, removing functional detail and reducing them to proportionate scale. Stripped of their intended purpose, the sculptures emphasize their collective display over individual objects. So there I've, I've, I've described what they are, 12 sculptures, what they represent, observation structures. Uh, they're based on watercolors, so speaking to the artist's process images that have been sourced from the internet and the structures have been made from everyday materials. Um, and then I've elaborated a bit and talked about the artist teaching himself to make these objects um, and the fact that they simplified from their real world reference points. So again, that was under 100 words. I also fully admit there's an uh, additional the <laughs> in the second sentence. Um, and I would recommend just trying to proofread things before you submit them. Um, not that it's always the biggest issue, but it can sometimes let you down um, when, you, when you can least afford it. And then finally, the third section is about describing the ideas and themes um, uh, that you're exploring. And so Lookout continues Cranston's interest in the legacy of modernism, his sculptures evoking the minimal aesthetic and industrial materials employed by artists like Donald Judd. More consequentially, however, they reflect the contemporary phenomenon of surveillance culture and how it is dovetailed with the COVID-19 pandemic. During the initial phase of lockdown, Cranston began reading Michel, Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish, especially regarding the Panopticon and the use of surveillance and isolation measures during the plague in Europe. The artist is also interested in how such forms of mass surveillance lead to self-censorship and the self-regulation of individual behaviour. So this was for um, a, a national art prize uh, in a public a state public institution. So obviously the level of detail and the assumed knowledge that um, I've included in the statement is, is more than you would necessarily need to include for um, an art prize with a regional gallery or the regional um, art awards, uh, often they will have a word limit. So it gives you a pretty clear sense of how much information you should or should not include. Um, so really, I, I would recommend when you're applying for, for um, opportunities and they ask for a statement to look at the, the conditions and see how many words they allow you for each section uh, and tailor your answer accordingly. So artwork labels, um, if you're if you're writing, um, and often these, if it's a group exhibition, a prize, the label is usually um, taken from your entry. So it's um, similar to but different um, from the artist statement in that it will usually typically address a particular work uh, or maybe a series of works, and so similar in terms of content and tone to the artist statement, but it needs to be suited for a wall label format. Format. Um, my rule of thumb would be a maximum of 150 words. <clears throat> and there may be a word limit that's prescribed. So um, again, this is an example of uh, 
a label that I've written for an upcoming exhibition that I've curated. So I'm writing about an artist's work and um, that is slightly different to writing about your own work. But I, I also think it's worth, um, you know, I think it's worth raising the opportunity or the value of um, writing about your peers' works as, as a kind of practice exercise that also makes you think more reflectively and thoughtfully on your own work um, as well. So Aaron Butt uh, lives just on shore from Bribie Island where Ian Fairweather settled in 1954 after his infamous raft journey. In recent years, Butt has engaged with aspects of Fairweather's biography to explore the relationship between abstraction and landscape painting. Raft Journey comprises a series of grayscale paintings that imagine Fairweather's ill-fated voyage from Darwin to Indonesia in 1952, from the artist's point of view. But researched available information, including the artist's own account to construct his images. They are figurative paintings of an abstract landscape focusing on a barely perceptible horizon, dividing the ocean from the sky. In Roti 7, Bart presents Fairweather's raft as if the artist had arrived safely on the Indonesian island, depicted in a more realist style and vibrant colour than the dreamlike raft journey. So what I've done there in 132 words is introduce the artist and their connection with the exhibition. This is an exhibition looking at the legacy of Ian Fairweather. So this is an artist who lives in the region and has engaged with um, Fairweather's biography an aspect or aspects of it. And he has communicated that through two artworks. So I then talk about the, um, the two works in some detail um, and, and, and sort of give a compare or contrast. So hopefully that gives a sense of the level of information that you could or should provide in an, art, in an artist um, artwork label. So artist biography, and look, this is in some way um, more factual or, or more um, straightforward than, than uh, the statement or label. This is, this is for introducing your practice and key achievements. And I think that's really important. And it's, it's about your art practice. Um, if you have a day job or you study law, that's fine, but it's not, um, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly relevant um, for the purposes of an artist bio. So educational achievements, again, um, these should be relevant to your practice. So a Bachelor of Fine Arts or a Master's of Visual Art or a, a doctorate. Um, and, and really it's about those key achievements. So solo exhibitions, uh, I, would, I would prioritize followed by group exhibitions residencies, awards, collections, and publications. So where your work has been exhibited, documented, prizes it's won, um, and if it's been written about. Uh, sometimes uh, biographies can include an introductory sentence about your work. Um, so I would, I would suggest looking back at the, the artist statement. And, and so if your work is focused on a particular issue or a particular medium, that can often be a starting sentence, uh, but again, try to keep the, the rest of the content um, tailored to, to those key, key, um, key achievements, um, qualifications, and um, those sort of milestones in your career. So this is uh, another bio that, um, that I have written recently. Um, and this is of an artist who's fairly well established, um, definitely mid-career, uh, with a number of, of major achievements uh, under their belt. And you'll see I've, um, I've uh, contained that information within about 160 words. So Archie Moore completed his Bachelor of Visual Arts at the Queensland University of Technology in 1998. He was awarded the Ann and Gordon Samstag International Visual Arts Scholarship in 2001, which enabled him to study at the Academy of Fine Arts in Prague. So what I've done there is very quickly laid out the artist's education credentials. So 
a Bachelor of Visual Arts and then being awarded a prestigious scholarship, which enabled him to study internationally. Moore has exhibited regularly throughout Australia over the past two decades, and his work has been curated into major exhibitions, including The Future Is Already Here, It's Just Not Evenly Distributed, the 20th Biennale of Sydney, and Defying Empire, Third National Indigenous Art Triennial National Gallery of Australia. So what I've done is from a really long exhibition biography is taken two recent-ish um, exhibitions that are, that are noteworthy um, on a national level. In 2018, Griffith University Art Museum staged the largest solo exhibition and first institutional survey of the artist's work to date, Archie Moore, 1970 to 2018, curated by Angela Goddard. So um, I, I could have put that sentence before um, in, in terms of it being a major solo survey exhibition, uh, but there, um, explaining what it is, uh, its, its exhibition title and who it was curated by. Moore's work is held in public collections, including Griffith University Art Museum, Monash University Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Canberra, and the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. And then I finish by uh, mentioning the artist's representative gallery. So that's a fairly standard structure of um, an artist biography, those key details. So uh, the purpose of an artist bio is instead of re reading through a four page CV, you know, it just gives you the, the summary, the highlights in one or two paragraphs. So um, just some tips that I thought are worth, uh, worth mentioning in, in um, again, uh, keeping it simple and avoiding art jargon. So especially if you don't understand it, um, it's really, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, the reasons that art writing gets um, a bit of flack sometimes is because it seems to, um, can I say bastardized <laughs> um, the English language. But as I said in those earlier, um, those earlier uh, slides, keep it simple and keep it relevant. Talk, as Jerry Salt said, um, write as if you are talking um, because you'll be able to communicate yourself um, in a more honest uh, and meaningful way. Um, and if you don't understand words, don't use them. Uh, a short, clear, concise statement or, or label is, is far more enjoyable to read um, than something that's that's full of big work, words for the sake of it. Um, and as I said before, one really good thing that you can do um, is to form a writing group with your peers. It may just be someone you share a studio space with. You might be part of a photography group or uh, a printmaking club. Um, and you could just do short exercises uh, writing on each other's work. So it could just be, we're gonna spend the next five minutes and come up with a short statement describing a work that we've all just made. <clears throat> and then you read them out to each other. And what that will do is help you um, start to sort of structure your own artist statements, but also to think about your own work differently in reflecting on someone else's work. Um, and then you could build it up over time and maybe become a bit more ambitious and write something longer and you go away and take it back and bring it to the next meeting. Um, I think that's a really useful practical way um, in a very safe and friendly environment with your peers to develop writing skills. Uh, and also think about your own work a bit more critically. Um, and as I said at the beginning, start writing and, and just keep writing, even if it's um, something that you write uh, as a personal practice, you may not feel comfortable sharing it, it may not be for an exhibition, but the more you write, the more confident you will start to feel um, in, in terms of articulating your own practice. And so before we move to questions, I just wanted to mention a couple of books that I think are really useful um, 
resources, uh, sources of inspiration, certainly for myself as a writer. Justin Payton, who is a New Zealand curator and writer, um, who now works at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, wrote a book in 2005 called How to Look at a Painting. And it's a small book, but it's one of the most um, beautiful and simply written um, uh, books about art that I've ever read. And I often return to it uh, as a source of reference, but also inspiration. Um, what I really like about this uh, text is that it communicates uh, the author, the author communicates their love of painting and art um, in a in a really thoughtful and meaningful and direct way. Um, there's no art jargon. It's um, it's very scholarly in the sense that he he goes back and engages with work throughout art history, but it's it's most of all a pleasure to read. And that's something that I always try to remember when I'm writing about work is is to make it enjoyable um, and to tell a story as well. And I think Justin does that very well. There was also a television series um, produced after that book, I believe. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you can still get copies online. But for me, that's a bit of a touchstone and one that I recommend to many people, artists and otherwise. The second one is, is Jerry Saltz, who I mentioned before. He published a book a couple of years ago um, called How to Be an Artist. And um, this is not so much about writing, although he's got lots of motivational words and, and, and um, tips of encouragement. It's more about uh, his advice for being an artist in general and, and, and including, including about reflecting on and writing um, about your work. It's very digestible. He writes it in small two-page sections, um, and it's accompanied with images of artworks that he he um, admires and, and is engaged with through his own writing practice. And um, although I'm not an artist myself, I, I found a lot of value in that book, and that's a fairly recent release, so I'm sure it would be available in bookstores, but also libraries. Um, <clears throat> reading. Uh, reading uh, about art is a really um, is a really useful exercise in terms of improving your own writing as well, and that doesn't um, have to be mean buying specialist publications. A lot of great art writing is online. The Guardian often publishes very digestible and thoughtful reviews of of major exhibitions here and overseas. Um, there are many online journals and platforms. Excuse me. Um, and there's even one that's um, started in Brisbane recently called Lemonade. <clears throat> Excuse me again. And um, I believe they're taking submissions for for not just um, normal length reviews, but for micro reviews, which they post on Instagram. And that is a really um, fun and small way that you could you could start experimenting um, writing about other artists' work as well. So that's um, essentially it from my presentation. I think I may have raced through it. Maddie, I'm sorry. Um, that was um, that was very constructive. Um, we do have time for questions, um, and I can see one that has come through from Robin now. Uh, Robin is asking, when you are writing, should you talk in the first or second person? Uh, once you introduce the artist, you seem to then only use the last name. Is this standard? Yeah, yeah so that's, um, I mean, in terms of, uh, I guess, objective writing, so artist statements, bios, labels, um, and because I'm a curator and a writer, not an artist, um, I, I do tend to use, um, <clears throat> excuse me, second person. I think where that can differ, obviously, if you're an artist writing about your own work, yes, then you definitely um, can use your own, uh, you can use first person. Um, uh, but I, 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 not to qualify or confuse that, um, you know, there are, there are many different ways of writing about art. And in recent years, there's 
there's been a real um, explosion, I guess, of creative responses to art. So that's another way you could ask uh, someone they may not feel comfortable writing an essay or a traditional uh, text about art, but a creative response. Um, if you're writing about a, a very close <clears throat> friend or peer, um, or if you if you're if you're wanting to sort of experiment with that with that sort of structure or genre and bring yourself into uh, writing about art, it's there's no right or wrong way. But I guess in terms of uh, this this webinar and, and giving you practical um, advice, then yeah, I, I would probably stick to second person because it's more objective. Oh, I can see another question from Libby. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice about writing about submissions for exhibitions and writing about work that hasn't been created yet? Yeah, and look, that can be tricky. And um, I, I fully admit that sometimes when I write about um, an artist's work for a, a magazine, say, the work has not been created. And there's been a few times where um, uh, the work that is ultimately produced is quite different from what <laughs> has been published. Um, but if you're applying for a grant or um, a residency, I think you can say, you can structure it uh, by saying, it is my intention that this project will consist of X paintings and two drawings. Um, and then what I would do is use, make sure you use the support material section to, to, to provide really good images of previous comparable projects. Or if it's not, if it's something you haven't done before, um, I think you can say based on my previous experience and exhibition of this body of work. So I think that's absolutely fine. And a lot of the time you are, I guess, projecting forward or or, or speculating to some degree, but it's about, I guess, giving confidence that you understand what you're doing and um, you are confident about the outcome. That's a great question. Thank you, Libby. Um, I can also see one from Cynthia as well. Um, tips for developing a proposal when formulating or introducing a new concept to your practice at the very early stages. Uh, I think if it's a, an application or a proposal to show some kind of connection or through line. So I guess whoever's reading it, assessing it, a selection panel or whoever can say, <clears throat> well, I can understand, you know, this might be new for this artist, a new concept, but um, they've clearly demonstrated how their practice has evolved and how it has gotten to this new concept. I think as long as you can make a, a connection um, um, between what you've done and where you want to go or what you want to do, it's really just about giving the reader, the selector, some confidence that you're capable of completing the project. Thank you, Cynthia. Does that answer your question? Oh, you're welcome, Libby. Um, We've also got a, another question from Charlotte in there too. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, so Charlotte is asking, when writing about exhibition history in a bio, how many years should you include? Oh, look, I mean, if you've been making work for a very long time, and and I, I fully acknowledge that I've, um, I guess, uh, my approach or, you know, I, sometimes assumes that you've had formal art training or that you're at a certain level. And I, I, I certainly don't mean to, um, um, uh, you know, not include uh, different types of practices or approaches. So if you've been making for a very long time, I think you can communicate that. Um, and in terms of a biography, um, you maybe say, I've started making in, 1965 or my first exhibition was in 1978 uh, and since then I've consistently exhibited or consistently 
maintained a private practice. Um, so what I think then is you give the, the broad brushstrokes rather than lots of individual exhibition examples. Um, and I think that shows commitment, consistency, dedication to practice without, the reader doesn't need to know every single detail and, and usually there's a CV section for those details, but to show you have a sustained practice over a long period of time and then maybe just include one or two major exhibitions or highlights or um, things that you think, achievements that you believe represent your practice. And I guess it's um, mostly communicating the story of uh, you as an artist um, and uh, what um, other key achievements, but also how that fits into your personal story. Absolutely, um, yeah. We also have a question from Carol. Thank you, Carol. Um, in your bio, should you only mention recent qualifications and exhibitions? Um, just wondering how recent your references should be if you have a long history of making. Oh, I, that's a, quite a similar question to the one. Yeah, and I, and I think I think it would, um, often there is a word count. I think for, for things like art competitions, exhibition, call outs, residencies, uh you know uh, the bigger picture uh, uh assessment panels selectors want to see i guess a commitment and a sustained practice if you've been making work over a long period um if it is applying for an opportunity i do think more recent examples are important because they demonstrate that you've had recent successes and achievements and and in my experience um you know, selection panels usually want that kind of, that assurance that <clears throat> that that you are um, competitive, if that makes sense. And often it's complementary to the work that you're putting forward as well. Right. So the writing should always, um, I guess, highlight important aspects of the work, the physical work that you've you're putting forward. Um, yeah. And that's you know, and I. I I know uh, I think I, I said earlier or touched on there are there's no right and wrong way I guess but in in thinking about um, very specific types of writing that that we've covered in this um, webinar that are that are sort of designed for specific um, purposes like so like applying for opportunities and having those sort of clear um, you know, well-structured and, and formatted uh, statements and labels and bios. The, the great thing is that particularly with um, artist statements and, and bios, that they can be used multiple times. Sometimes you might tweak, if it's for a residency, then you might put in a residency that you've done previously and take out an exhibition, for example. Um, we also have a question from Alison. Um, what advice would you give to a brand new artist with no art history? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> um, I would say, um, first of all, go and look at local artists, your peers, colleagues, um, look online. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned Jerry Saltz. You know, I think his book, which I'm sure you could get from the library or, or, or order online if you want your own copy, um, sort of uh, assumes no knowledge or don't think you, if you don't, if you haven't studied art history, um, and lots of artists I know um, <laughs> don't know their art history either. So I would, I would say work out what it is you, your work is about or what you are making work about. And maybe you find some connections just through doing an internet search or you go to a, a local gallery and you see an exhibition and something really responds to you, um, then that gives you a bit of a, a framework or a reference point, but you can talk about it in terms that are comfortable and relevant for you. Um, I think that's probably the most important point. Just as I, I said, don't use big art jargon words if you don't understand them, don't. There's no pressure to, um, if you if you are influenced by someone then mention it but if not don't feel there's pressure to do that either 
Um, and we have a question from Kara and Simpson as well. Um, yeah. uh, similar type of question, um, but a, a, any advice for an artist who's recently come back to their practice after a, a period of time off? Um, yeah, I think you can say, and you, you don't have to give personal details. I think you can say, <clears throat> I studied or I, I had a, a sustained a practice over a long period. Um, after a recent break or a, an extended break, I have recently returned to art making can be as simple and general as that. You, you don't need to give private details away. You can all, I'm, I guess you can, it's whatever you're comfortable with, but I, I think that's fine as well. I would, but again, it's about that bigger narrative that you had a practice, you took some time off, but you've returned. And, and again, that's where I would, um, you know, list, just be very strategic or specific about examples. So if you haven't had an exhibition for a long time, that's fine. Um, maybe talk about some other achievements or what it is looking forward that you're wanting to do with your practice. Um, we have a question as well from Trish. Um, what about quoting poetry in an artist statement? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's fine. I'm not, um, uh, I think that's a really lovely idea. I, I feel like maybe if it's depending on length as well, um, maybe not a full length poem, but if it's just a, a verse or, and, and maybe sort of to create some context um, about why it's there. So this is a poem that has resonated with me or uh, this work can, uh, you know, is informed in part by um this poem or this part of a poem i actually saw one on um reposted on instagram today i think it was bridie gilman who's a brisbane-based painter who's just had a show in adelaide and she writes her own poetry and often includes that in or is just a standalone artist statement i think in an exhibition that's absolutely fine um i think if you're applying for something then you probably need to provide the a bit more context around why you're including the poetry. Mm, yeah, and I think it comes back to with artist statements, making sure that every element mentioned is um, is relevant and yeah. fits within the parameters. That's right. Um, of what your the end product is, where you're putting the art, artist statement at the end of the day. Um, another question from Carol. Uh, I hear there's less interest in formal qualifications when applying for opportunities. Is this true? There seems to be a shift in emphasis in that the work should stand alone. Oh, look, I think it's, I think qualifications are irrelevant always up to a point. Um, if you're applying, I think if it's a, a localised prize or it's, it's a, it's a exhibition, um, maybe not a grant or a, um a residency uh and i think again play right to your strengths um you may not have qualifications but if you've got a solid exhibition history then that's absolutely right they will judge you on someone who uh, as someone who has obviously maintained a practice and an exhibition history um i think as well if you don't have an exhibition history or um formal uh, experiences having confidence in your work is an asset too and having the confidence for your work to stand alone uh, without those supporting experiences is really important um oh sandra you're more than welcome uh thanks for joining um allison is asking uh hamish what is the best source listing opportunities within Queensland nationally or internationally? Oh, um, oh look, uh, I'd, I'd stay local. I, I personally, I, I look at, I subscribe to Arts Hub, which is a national platform and they have uh, news stories, articles, but also jobs and opportunity listings. Um, Local government is often a good, your your local council. I, I previously worked for a council and, um, you know, they had a mailing list and where they would update or send out monthly updates of what the current opportunities for 
culture and creative arts were. Um, and so starting with your local council is a really good place to start and then what maybe work your way outwards and see what opportunities there are statewide. Maddie, you might have some insight. Does Flying Arts, they you often promote other opportunities, yeah? Yeah, um, so I would concur with Arts Hub and local councils, um, particularly for more localised opportunities. They're really great to go to for um, even just information on what's coming up. Um, they might be doing project planning or things like that that hasn't been properly advertised yet, but they would be keen to hear from an artist or receive support letters or interest from. Um, in, uh, I, sorry, I'm reading the question again. Um, Flying Arts does offer um, uh, resources, particularly on our social media. Um, we often repost opportunities within the sector in Queensland and particularly for regional artists, um, as well as if you're looking for more exhibition opportunities, Museums and Galleries Queensland, uh, their e-news is a really great place to go. Um, and I, honestly, probably um, social media at the moment, a balance of signing up to e-news from the uh, central, or, the major Queensland uh, peak bodies, um, as well as following people on social media um, is, is very helpful. And I know a lot of, I, I certainly know from outer spaces experience that social media is, is how our audience um, predominantly engages with opportunities, even more so than our emails or website. But I think together they provide a comprehensive reach. Can I also suggest, Maddie, that so social media is a great way, well, it, it can be a platform to, to sort of um, hone your writing skills as well. It's something that I've always used as a, as a professional tool. And so if I see an exhibition that really, um, you know, that I get something out of that I find very engaging for a particular reason, um, and uh, I don't do this all the time, but sometimes, you know, I'll go away and reflect on it and I might write a hundred words and put it on my Instagram with a photograph. Um, and, and that could be a nice safe space or, or way for you to develop or, or have a go at writing as well. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, we have a comment from Jeffrey, very informative and helpful for an artist who began creating in 19... 67. Uh, you're very welcome, Jeffrey. Thank wow, you for joining thanks, us Jeffrey. today. Um, we have another uh, comment from Alison. A transcript, unfortunately, won't be available, Alison, but we will post this to our YouTube um, and there will be captions on that uh, posting. Um, so you're more than welcome. We'll send out a link afterwards. Um, and uh, hopefully that will be um, easier to, to hear. Um, does anyone have any final questions? We've got a couple minutes left. Um, while uh, you potentially pose your final questions, I'll just mention, so following the webinar, I'll send out to each of you a link for feedback on the session today. Um, as well as in a few days, I'll send out that link to the uh, YouTube uh, video if you did want to come back and rewatch. Uh, I will also mention if you are a regional artist, I would definitely encourage you to apply for the Queensland Regional Art Awards. Um, applications close at the end of next month and more information can be found on the Flying Arts website. Uh, if you do have further questions, um, we'll jump to the, our next slide. Um, if you do have further questions after this program, please feel free to reach out. Flying Arts do have uh, these professional development webinars fairly consistently. Um, I'll also mention that we're starting to program next year. So if you do have suggestions on particular programs that you would like, please let us know. We are a demand-driven organisation uh, and often uh, we'll take on uh, all of your feedback and comments uh, for our following year of
programming. So please do let us know what you'd like to hear potentially next year. Uh, and um, yeah, we're a service organization uh, for regional and remote artists, but also for metropolitan artists. So if you would like to be pointed in uh, a particular direction, um, we can assist you. Uh, and I'll jump to my next slide. It's a big thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, excellent questions. And thank you very much, Hamish, for sharing your expertise and knowledge. I can't see any other questions coming through. Um, um, thanks, Maddie. And I, I'd just like to thank everyone for their um, time and interest. And um, yeah, as, as with you, the really um, wonderful questions. And um, don't be afraid of writing, I would say. Yes, or asking for help. Don't be a stranger. Yeah. Um, so if you do need assistance, please feel free to reach out. Uh, it is what we're here for. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. I will conclude the webinar there, but if you do have questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.